Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I've been wanting to interview Tara McCauley since I started this show, so I'm glad we finally got to catch up in Oxford recently. If this episode speaks to you, you should be aware that the Centre for Effective Altruism is hiring an event specialist, UK operations specialist, US operations specialist, and a project manager for the office of the CEO. You can learn about those roles at centerforeffectivealtruism.org slash careers. Applications are closing in two weeks from when I expect this episode to come out, so take a look now if you're at all interested. CEA and 80,000 Hours work together pretty closely, so you'd also be helping out 80,000 Hours if you took any of those roles. Without further ado, here's Tara. Today, I'm speaking with Tara McCauley. She has a pretty eclectic background, having worked in senior operations roles uh, while in high school and as an undergraduate. She did a degree in pharmacy, then worked at a hospital in Melbourne, at Deloitte, and at the Red Cross in several countries. She later worked at the Center for Applied Rationality before becoming Chief Operations Officer for the Center for Effective Altruism and then being promoted to CEO. She's now earning to give in entrepreneurship. So uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, Tara. Thank you. We've done an episode with Tanya Singh where we discussed the core messages in our article, Why Operations is One of the Key Bottlenecks in Effective Altruism. So here I wanted to hear some stories from your just generally fascinating uh, work history and operations and also find out where, if anywhere, you disagree with uh, that article about operations careers in effective altruism organizations. But first off, yeah, tell us how you started your career, just in general. So one of the first jobs I actually had was working at a fast food restaurant called Aporto, which was sort of like Nando's, it's a, a chicken shop. And I just started working there as a cook in the kitchen. And I think that was a really great experience for me because it's a really fast-paced environment where you're put under a lot of pressure to do a whole range of different tasks really quickly. And they were all things that I'd never done before. And I really loved being thrown into a systems-based environment where there were checklists everywhere and you were told how long each of these different tasks should take. And I think I got to learn a lot from that. It just kind of felt like a game, like where I could optimize all of the different motions that I took in the order in which I did all of the tasks to try and tick off everything in that checklist, find things that were missing from the checklist that should be added, or like tweak it in little ways to make my work more effective and to sort of make it go smoother for everyone who worked there. And I did that for a little while. And at one point, I bought a stopwatch to work. And then I timed myself for all of the tasks that I did commonly and timed lots of other people. And I compared like how long it took me to do it one way versus lots of different ways and kind of did that over a couple of days until I found like the most efficient way to do all of the tasks that I had to do at that organization. So then I like got promoted to manager of the shop and then ended up working with a lot of new franchisees to train their staff and build new systems to run these chicken shops really effectively. So like one thing I did there was to come up with a, a predictive ordering system based on really hilarious things like the weather forecast for the day to try and predict what things people would order and how much stock we needed to have so that we could fulfill all the customer orders and how many staff we needed to have on shift at all the different times uh, so that the, the shop would be more profitable. And by implementing that system, we were able to cut staff costs by 30% and make a lot of stores that were failing profitable again. How old are you at this point? <laughs> um, when I was doing that, I was... I was about 15 or probably 16. <laughs> uh, it was very unusual uh, that I was like, you know, advising franchisees who are usually kind of semi-retired in their 50s or 60s yeah. and people who had run a lot of businesses before. So it was pretty challenging for me to come in and basically be trying to tell them how to do their jobs and how to run their business. Yeah. So what's going on here? How come like a 15 year old could come into this established restaurant chain and significantly improve their inventory management and cut their staff costs? by 30? So you were cutting staff costs because you figured out when people needed to be there and when they didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What, what do you think equipped you to do this? <laughs> Feel free to flatter yourself. <laughs> I think it's reasonable under the circumstances. I think a lot of people approach that job by feeling like they were kind of subject to the system that they were a part of and that not that it was something that, was, that they could change or influence in any way. And so other people hated the checklist and hated being told like when they should do something and how they should do something really simple like mop the floor. But I approached it with this optimizing mindset and I thought it was really fun to just kind of figure out what was the, the best way of doing things. And I think I, you know, 
by nature, I tend to question authority a little bit. So I didn't just accept that what I was being told was already sort of the, the most efficient and most optimized way of doing things. Also, like the job itself was a little bit boring and not super challenging, right? So, so this what was were you actually hired to do in fun. the first place? <laughs> so, um, basically to flip to flip burgers. At the start, I just operated the grill and I would, you know, work all day in a hot kitchen, uh, like cleaning all of the equipment and like cooking chicken burgers. Okay. And how did you convince them to allow you to uh, like start reorganizing the, the store? <laughs> Were you just clearly a cut above like the, the other staff? And I guess you wanted to do it? I kind of just did it. Like the day I bought in the stopwatch, I just decided to do that and I, I just did it. And then I kind of let the results speak for themselves. And I did get a lot of pushback from the other managers or from the franchisees. But then I had the data to back up all of these claims that I was making. And I could show them how much more efficiently we could do things just by reorganizing things a little bit. And I kind of had to stake my reputation on it a little bit and say, like, look, I believe that this will make your business this much more profitable or this much more efficient. And and like, we can try it for a week, and if it doesn't work, you know, you can fire me, or we can go back to doing it the old way. So yeah. I had to kind of negotiate to get them to agree. Okay, uh, so this was at the so the first store you, you hired to flip burgers. Then you improve their their staff management, their inventory management. So the shop becomes more profitable. Uh, what what happened then? <laughs> Well, at the time, uh, I was in pharmacy school, and I had a, another like couple of years left in my degree. So then they tried to convince me to work for them full time, and so they offered me a full time role there, um, and with like a pretty decent salary. And they wanted me to drop out of university. And I thought about that quite a bit, and then I decided that I could probably do both at the same time. So I took on the full-time job at Oporto and then sort of continued doing my studies on the side um, so I could learn a lot from there. And there I learned a lot about management and about organisational politics and about hiring and firing and how to assess like assess talent basically like to figure out who would be good for this organization and how to build an effective team yeah if i remember correctly um the the chain was somewhat struggling at the time right they were in the process of closing stores and you managed to save some of them yeah the store had just gone through this like rapid expansion so they went from being about uh sort of 20 or 30 stores all in sydney and they expanded to all of the states in Australia and also set up some stores overseas. And they kind of expanded a bit too quickly before they'd really nailed down a lot of these good systems and processes. Uh, and so then there were six stores all owned by one guy who was like super overconfident in Melbourne. And those stores were all like on the verge of being shut down because they weren't generating a profit. And so I got sent in to try and save those stores. Yeah, and what did you do to, to, to try to make them profitable again? And, and how many how many stores was this? And, and again, how yeah, old were you six. at this point? <laughs> Sorry, I was I was sixteen. Sixteen. Like okay. yep. um, <laughs> so, the first store I went into was like a Porto in Knox City, and I went in and decided to just work with the staff for a couple of days to observe. And so I didn't tell the staff what my role was or what I was there to do. I just worked on the grill and watched what was happening. And I quickly gathered that the culture in that workplace was one of the main things that was holding them back. And sort of a lot of the staff who worked there sort of didn't take a lot of pride in their work and just sort of were having a lot of fun and joking around together. Uh, and one person in particular was sort of the ringleader of that group who was encouraging a lot of bad behaviour in some of the other staff okay. and encouraging other staff to kind of shirk their duties a little bit. Huh. Um, in particular, the store had a policy uh, that if the work wasn't finished at the end of the day, that they would pay staff overtime. And so the first thing I did after that week of observing was I changed that rule and mm. I made it such that yeah, no one could go home until everything was done rather than people being able to leave as soon as they'd finished their work. And that mm. really changed the culture and made it like feel like more of a team because everyone mm. had to like rely on other people to do their work efficiently and get everything done so that they could get home on time. And some of the staff had families to get home to or other reasons that they wanted to leave on time and other staff wanted to stay and be paid overtime. But that really like caused everyone to pull together and figure out how we can change things. And it gave me like an in to kind of suggest some changes we could make so that we could achieve that goal. So you could finish on time. Yeah. So what's the scenario where you send in a 16 year old to observe everyone? It reminds me of those reality TV shows where you have like the secret CEO like integrated into the company who goes and like finds out about how things really are on the shop floor. How do people react when they found out that you were like not just there to flip burgers? Was there ever kind of some big reveal? I think that initially all of the staff sort of didn't really believe it and they tried to they tried to scare me. Like, 
you know, one of the staff uh, sprayed me with a water gun as soon as I walked into the store. And so I got completely drenched. And I think they were testing me to see how I would react. And (laughs) how long did that staff member last before getting laid off? (laughs) Um, I didn't actually end up firing him in the end. He ended up really like, you know, turning over a new leaf and becoming one of the like becoming a team leader and one of the most productive members of the team. So that was really great. Okay, so so you found a way to, to get the staff to, to work together better. Were there any other improvements that you managed to, to find that saved a lot of money? And, and I guess, uh, you know, what fraction of stores that you looked at did you manage to, to save from shutting down? I think I managed to save about two-thirds of the stores. A lot of what I did was make sort of small improvements in process that were then te- were tested in one store, and then when they worked, they were shipped out to all, like, 120 stores all over the country. Hmm. I sort of touched on this before, but one thing was really was ordering and to try and predict the needs when we opened up a new store. So when we open up a new store, you have to purchase a lot of expensive equipment, like number of grills and fryers and things. And so to really try and do some more research before going into a new environment to predict what sort of product mix would be ordered in that new store, which really depends on the demographics of the population there, whether it's in a shopping centre or a strip mall um, and lots of other various things like that. Even simple things like the weather like people would order really different things on hot days compared to cold days which seems like obvious in retrospect mm. but no one had really looked at that or considered it and quantified it so they knew what things they should order yeah do you remember what kind of model you made i'm guessing this is an excel spreadsheet where you looked for kind of the correlations yeah absolutely it was like a really shitty very simple excel so, spreadsheet okay like uh, just a single linear regression or like multi-linear yep. regression <laughs> <laughs> yep like yeah. I, a lot of the time it wasn't even that sophisticated yeah. a lot of the time i would just like mm. dump all my data into a spreadsheet and kind of i ball it oh right um, okay like, but that was still a massive that was improvement. still a massive improvement yeah, yeah. Yep. very cool okay so uh that was helping uh to scale up a restaurant which is mm-hmm. uh impressive for a 16 year old but uh, perhaps <laughs> perhaps not the most important problem in the world uh but something <laughs> something that's a, a bit more impactful was uh, i think a year or a couple of years later you were working at a hospital right uh this is why yep. you're doing your pharmacy degree um yeah and um, if, I, if i recall you managed to save them uh <laughs> millions of dollars basically uh, do you want to describe how you did that <laughs> yeah so after i graduated from pharmacy school i went in sort of to my first job as a very junior intern pharmacist at St. Vincent's Hospital. And there were a lot of similarities to the work that I had done at Porto. I was thrown into an unfamiliar environment. I had more patients than I knew how to handle and lots of different demands on my time. So for the first couple of months, I did the same thing. I carried around a stopwatch. I timed myself on all of the tasks. I counted how many steps it was between all of the different wings to try and figure out the best route that I could take to like get all of my work done as quickly as possible. And then after that, I started trying to like figure out how I could improve the workflow of all of the other people that I worked with as well. And a thing that pharmacists in the hospital did that a lot of people really hated was kind of running around restocking medicines. So you would always get a call from, say, the emergency department and they'd say, we'd run out of drug X. And no matter what you're doing, you have to kind of drop everything, run back to the pharmacy, get that drug and bring it to the emergency department because they need that. Uh, And so I figured out that pharmacists were spending like 30% of their time on these kind of ad hoc drug requests, which meant that that was time that they weren't spending with their patients. And on top of that, it was also significantly increasing mortality for a lot of patients there. There are a lot of like very kind of like urgent requirements in cases where every minute that you delay causes worse outcomes for those patients. So I, again, pulled a lot of data from the pharmacy dispensing system to try and figure out which drugs were most commonly out of stock. The hospital was using a really like kind of simple uh, PAR based system for stocking all of their drug cabinets around the hospital, where they would just have sort of a minimum allowable quantity and a maximum allowable quantity for every single drug. And you'd go around, and if it's below the minimum, you top it up to the maximum. That didn't change based on the day or the time of day or even the time of year, even though we know that lots of that there are lots of variations in that. So what I did was to try to link hospital admissions data to uh, the pharmacy dispensing system so that we could predict how much we would use of various different antibiotics or other drugs at different places in the hospital at different times and make sure that those life-saving drugs sort of never went out of stock. Based on uh, who was being admitted? With yep. what conditions? Yeah, based on the, like the primary diagnosis, which was the only thing I used at that point in time. Okay, so we've got, we've got two examples here where someone who's quite junior has come in and just seen massive efficiency improvements uh, that were sitting there on the table. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this is universal uh, or is it very common? And, and if so, like, uh, does just the whole world suck because people aren't paying attention? <laughs> what, what's the explanation? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think these kind of things exist everywhere. And it's a lot of it is because like my colleagues at the hospital were all astounded at what I did. And they were like, this isn't your job. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you putting in so much effort? Or, or like, who is allowing you to do this? And <laughs> the thing that I said is like, you don't need permission. You don't need to be allowed to do something that's not in your job description. If you think that it's going to make your company or your organization more successful and more efficient, you can often just go and do it. I mean, is that true everywhere? I, there's like various <laughs> political reasons why, you know, people, well, there's, there's always the risk, right? That uh, you let someone junior do something and then they mess it up. And so people might be cautious for that reason. That's the most common thing I see. You also get the problem that you might show up <laughs> that the other staff are no good uh, or that the, the boss should have done this already. Um, have you ever encountered that kind of resistance? Absolutely. Like, when I was a junior pharmacist, I had a lot to learn about organizational politics mm. and I did cause fights yeah. among the department. And I think the lesson I learned from that was that I really needed to model all of the people involved in the decision making process and figure out who in the organization could block me, basically, or could like could cancel my project or prevent me from doing what I needed to do and then figure out what they cared about, what things mattered to them and how I could get them on side and get them to agree. So I figured out that, like, say, the head of the nursing department had really different KPIs from the head of medicine and I needed to show them that my project wasn't going to negatively affect their KPIs and was in fact going to like help them like achieve the goals for their department before I could kind of get the go-ahead to start experimenting with some of these things. Okay, uh, so coming back to the, to the, to the hospital pharmacy, you improved the, the stocking of drugs in the emergency ward and I guess so, yeah, other, other wards um, trying to predict what they needed. Were, were there any other major contributions that you made there? Yeah, I realised that a lot of sort of data in the hospital was really siloed and they'd say the pharmacy department was collecting was the only source of information on sort of patient drug use and that then the pathology department had a completely different database and what the doctors used to put in prescriptions was completely different and none of that information was being shared and I think that's a common problem you see all over the world not just in healthcare but in in any kind of discipline and so I started building my own database where I requested uh, access to you know the pathology database and the medical database and then tried to build a uh, like very shitty kind of combined database which at the start was just a Google spreadsheet and then I made a really shitty database in Microsoft Access which I had never used before and had no idea how it worked to try and uh, like combine a lot of that information and the reason I wanted to do that was to figure out how we could better treat uh, rare presentations. So when a complex patient would come in who had, you know, kidney failure, who was taking 20 or 30 different medications and who needed to be on chemotherapy, uh, very often it was sort of more art than science because the doctors wouldn't have a lot of clinical expertise in treating that specific patient. Whereas with my database, I could look up and find similar patients that we'd had in the past and figure out what had been done there and what we could learn about how to improve our treatment from, you know, the, the millions of visits that we'd had at the hospital so far. What were the, the, the biggest barriers that you found to doing this? Um, uh, were they political or did, I mean, was it actually, was it actually challenging from an operations point of view or was it all just straightforward there? It was just, it just required someone who had the gumption to come in and ask the right questions. So I had to learn a lot of new skills. Like before then I'd never done any data analysis except for like my shitty spreadsheets. I didn't know anything about databases. There were also a lot of uh, privacy concerns, but the, the main thing was was really the politics of it. So, like, the IT department was responsible for permissions on all of the different databases and how that information was stored and the, the sort of data architecture and who could make what kind of queries on the system. And they were pretty protective of that and also pretty slow moving. And they because they weren't clinicians, they didn't really understand the use cases that we cared about. And so they had a form where you could request any of this data, but then it would take two weeks for them to get it back to you. And by that time, your patient's you know, either discharged or might might have passed away. And so that's far too late. So it was a lot of just like getting buy-in from all of the different parties and all of the different groups in the hospital, figuring out who the decision makers were and what things they cared about to get it done. Did your colleagues realise that these improvements were possible and they just thought it was politically or, or you know, they didn't have the time to, to, to take on these challenges? Or were they just uh, not paying attention and were they not aware that these improvements uh, might be possible? I think it was a little bit of both. A lot of people knew that there were problems with our uh, like drug distribution system before, mm -hmm. but no one really knew like what could be done about it or how it could be improved or how we could figure out 
how we could even figure out how to improve it. So he sort of didn't know where to start. Yeah. Uh, whereas I just kind of like jumped in and tried to like look at some data and come up with some ideas and figure out how I could test if those things were better. And a lot of the time, like a lot of people responded with a like, that's not my job sort of thing. Like they would realize that there were problems, but they didn't were worried about kind of overstepping or they felt like they were too stressed out and didn't have enough time in their work day to dedicate to these to sort of other the projects. System. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So remember you're like 18 or 19 at this point? <laughs> I was 20. 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Slightly getting more reasonable. What did you do before you got this uh, job at the restaurant? Uh, it, it sounds like you must have had some experience like working with spreadsheets or working with data or... Or is, it, is that not the case? You just like went into work and then on, the, on your first day just had an incredible amount of energy and, uh, and innovativeness. I mean, I'd like used Excel a little bit at school and at university, but I was by no means an expert. Yeah. And I just resorted to Google. And I think it was really, I learned so much because it was really motivating to me. Like I had a problem that I wanted to solve yeah. and I just needed to figure out what skills I needed in what I had to learn in order to solve that problem. And so I kind of engaged in a lot of just-in-time learning rather than yeah. up front learning and I kind of became an Excel whiz because I had to not because like I thought it might be useful for some future project yeah this is slightly unrelated but I'm curious to know what you think of kind of the fix on fail idea that you should fix things uh, once they actually go wrong because that way you avoid wasting time fixing things that are never going to actually go wrong or, or not going to matter that much I guess in my experience everywhere you look there are hundreds of things going wrong all of the time <laughs> and my viewpoint is kind of based around kind of like seeking perfection in systems and so anything that could be better is a problem and that's something that's going wrong and that then you just need to prioritize those and figure out what the biggest bottlenecks are and and work on those did any of your efforts to uh, you know increase efficiency at the hospital or in the restaurant uh, backfire did you make any like big mistakes i made a lot of political mistakes particularly in the early days so one thing I really championed in the geriatrics ward of the hospital was pharmacists uh, reviewing medication for patients who are on more than 20 medications. And I didn't realize at the time that this was something that social workers at the hospital saw as part of their job and was something that they could offer families as kind of an olive branch is they could be the ones who are seen to be advocating for like the comfort and like ease of daily living for patients by sort of uh, reviewing medications and figuring out which ones were causing the patient's problems and then how uh, then advocating on their behalf to the doctors or nurses to try and get those medications ceased. So I kind of like overstepped a bit there and then took away something that was sort of better. It did fit better in the pharmacist role, but it was fulfilling this like, like important piece in how the social workers like gained trust with mm. their clients. It's interesting because that's an example where it's political in a sense, but I guess uh, that the social workers there aren't being self-serving so much. They're not yeah. protecting their self, they're, they're protecting something that's actually kind of cross-subsidizing another activity that's important to them. Yeah. Did you manage to figure that out and kind of correct it once they explained it? Sort of. I'm not sure I like, did <laughs> the best job on this, but then I experimented with having uh, a like social worker prompted or led medication review where the social worker and the pharmacist would sit down together or the social worker would then like call in the pharmacist to have a discussion with the family and they would kind of lead or guide that and inform the pharmacist of the patient's wishes and which things were bothering them so they could work together more collaboratively mm. and that that helped quite quite a bit okay so I think a few years ago you told me that you saved like a couple of million dollars for the hospital in avoiding drugs getting thrown out. Uh, is yep. that right? Did you, do you remember the exact, exact figure? Uh, yeah, it was $8 million. $8 million. Okay, yeah. How, how did you calculate that? Did you calculate that? Did someone else calculate <laughs> uh, yeah, that? Yeah, I calculated okay. that. Um, it was, yeah, it was a combination of two things. So both the cost of uh, drugs that were not expired and then also the cost of fines that the hospital was paying basically to the state government for times when they had um, kind of failed to meet some of their benchmark criteria. So uh, if they, say, didn't uh, see a patient within four hours of them being admitted to the emergency department, the hospital would get fined. And so making sure that the drugs were available prevented a lot of those fines. And so that the fines and um, made up about $2 million worth of that. And then another, I think between two and four million dollars was a figure that the hospital used for sort of days 
of admissions saved, where the hospital used a figure of $800 per uh, day of hospital stay. So um, I was able to figure out like that uh, availability of medication prevented some patients, uh, or like quick, making sure that the patients were treated really promptly, uh, prevented I can't remember exactly how many days of hospital stay, but it meant that a lot of people were kind of discharged sooner than they would have been had they not received care promptly. And so there was that as well as the actual cost of drugs. Do you know if any other hospitals uh, in Melbourne tried to adopt these these methods or whether they're, they're common elsewhere? Yeah, I presented my findings at um, the National Pharmacy Conference and then got a lot of interest from other hospitals who used the same dispensing systems and they wanted my spreadsheets and my code uh, so that they could start implementing that. And so then there were, I think, six hospitals that at least tried to implement some of the same procedures, but I don't know exactly how that went. Okay, so uh, let's move on from the hospital. Uh, I think after that you went to the Red Cross, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. Was that because you were getting interested in effective altruism and wanted to have more impact, or was it for different reasons? It was a combination of things. So I was interested in effective altruism when I was working at the hospital and I'd thought for a long time about whether I could have more impact sort of yeah, working in uh, developing countries and or working for an organisation like the World Health Organisation or the Red Cross overseas. And for a while I thought that I was sort of having such an outsized impact at the hospital where I was working that it was likely that that was more effective, in particular because I could build systems that could then be transferred to other hospitals and other clinical settings and have that work kind of spread. But then this really amazing opportunity came up for me to work with the Red Cross uh, where I would sort of go in and do a a capacity assessment of various different hospitals to figure out uh, what conditions they could safely treat, what medications they should stock, how they should ensure a reliable supply chain. And I thought that that was like a particularly good fit for my skill set and an opportunity for me to learn a lot more about development and really kind of grow. So I took that. Uh, Yeah. So which country did you go to first? Well, I first spent some time in Indonesia, where I mostly looked at malnutrition and I mostly worked with um, educating community health workers there so that because there was a shortage of qualified health professionals to deliver care. So what kind of things did you uh, end up teaching them about? Weirdly the thing I ended up doing a lot of was scabies treatment. Community health care workers were uh, finding it quite difficult to get uh, scabies patients to use their sort of like standard treatment which requires a patient to like cover their entire body in this really like sticky gross cream and it was really the cream that they were using was the cheapest one but it was very um kind of oily and greasy and indonesia is a really hot and humid environment so patients were using that ointment very uh sparingly and they were kind of really unhappy about it and the the standard treatment is like the patient should use should apply it to their whole body and anyone in close contact with them should do the same so whole families who are sleeping together under the same roof should have to apply this ointment to their whole body and they were just having massive like treatment failures so i actually advocated for the hospital purchasing a different type of uh, water-based cream that contained the same drug was just as effective. It cost almost double the amount uh, per treatment, but uh, treatment success went way up because people (laughs) would actually use it. And I think that they were trying really hard to focus on cost effectiveness, but they were just missing like one of these key pieces of the puzzle. And that was something I was able to dig into by like sitting and talking with the patients about it and figuring out what was going on. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's half the cost if it doesn't work. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, what other uh, things did you manage to, to teach them? And do you think you had much of an impact there? I don't think that I did really manage to have that much of an impact. Like, I spent quite a lot of time uh, reviewing a lot of different projects that the Red Cross was involved in and trying to do some kind of naive cost-effectiveness calculations. And then after I did all of this work, I presented my findings to like my boss at the Red Cross. And what I found was that a lot of the programs used... Uh, skilled volunteers from Australia who were then like sent out into other communities where they kind of didn't understand the context or that kind of thing Uh, and the Red Cross was like really excited about these sort of programs and I found that a lot of them were like were just not very cost effective and that both the volunteers were dissatisfied with the work they were doing and the amount of impact that they were having and also that they weren't really uh, producing like lasting change in the communities that they were going into. So I advocated for like scaling back some of those programs uh, and that was not politically feasible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, kind of caused me to become really disheartened with the organisation as a whole. Uh, not politically feasible, is that a euphemism? Or, or, <laughs> or, or what was the reason? 
Uh, yeah, I think my like boss at the Red Cross made a lot of arguments about how it was an enriching experience for volunteers and how volunteers went on to become donors to the Red Cross or would go back to their home country and would, would sort of encourage other people to be more altruistic. And so I went and I tried to include all of those effects in my calculation of cost effectiveness and it still didn't look good. Okay. And every time there was another reason. And so I sort of felt that... Um, you weren't hitting like, people's true rejection. Yeah. yeah. So then after Indonesia, you went to Bhutan, right? Yep. What, what did you discover and, and learn there? I went into Bhutan to set up a cancer treatment center, basically. So I was told that the hospital had a pretty advanced uh, treatment program mostly for uh, stomach cancer, that they were providing uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy at the hospital there. But when I arrived, I was really shocked to find that their chemo cabinet had no venting, which meant that all of the operators were constantly exposed to cytotoxic agents. And in fact, some of the workers at the hospital had developed cancer due to occupational exposure of cytotoxic <sighs> agents. Uh, I guess they didn't have to go anywhere for treatment, but that's like <laughs> extremely morbid. Yep. Uh, okay. And um, that, that, uh, there are other problems I'm guessing if they did that? Absolutely. So I think that in Bhutan... A lot of the clinicians were just operating outside of their skill set or level of training, but were a bit like unaware of that fact. So uh, dosing of chemotherapy is pretty complex. Like You need to use body surface area to dose a lot of chemo, and then you make a lot of modifications to the dosing dependent on, say, the patient's lab results, so their, their blood tests and their vitals. And what I found was that uh, there were a lot of errors being made in the dosing of chemotherapy because the baseline level of arithmetic was just sort of a bit too low to safely dose chemotherapy in this kind of setting. So it was remarkably common for me to see uh, order of magnitude errors in calculation and a lot of just very simple errors with uh, division or multiplication or failing to like carry figures, uh, even though this was being double-checked with the calculator. And as well as having poor arithmetic skills, the clinicians lacked the sort of experience or knowledge to know when they'd made a calculation error because the result was outside of the normal range. So I think in like my experience in Australia, if you do the calculation and you come up with something that is like 10 times the normal dose, you'll sort of recognize that and check your calculation. So that'll give you some idea that you've made an error and that you need to go back and check. But that level of clinical knowledge just wasn't there. So these errors weren't being caught. Wouldn't they just notice that it was an unusual amount of the drug to be dispensing? Surely you just like develop a pattern. I was like, you know, this is the typical dose, and then, but they're not picking that up. You would think so. Yeah. Another problem I ran into was with like the culture of treatment. So like doctors and particularly the, the doctors who prescribed chemotherapy were really well respected in the community there. And the nurses, pharmacists and technicians didn't feel comfortable bringing that up with the doctors if the doctor was the one who made a mistake. And there was this idea that you should always defer to seniors and think that they were, the, that they were kind of infallible. And this is something that has been worked on a lot back in Australia where there have been a lot of training programs to get nurses and uh, other members of the healthcare team to speak up and to question authority when they think that there's something that might affect patient care. And so this was something I really had to work on as well. I mean, an unwillingness to question the answers that you're getting or the, yeah, the instructions that you're getting, plus uh, just messing up all the time because you can't do math. This I mean, it sounds like it would be absolutely fatal, right? I mean, were, were patients just often dying as a result of this? Yeah. So sort of one of my like worst days in Bhutan was when I was starting to realize that and I decided to actually crunch the numbers. And so I went through and looked at uh, all of the patients who had records in the hospital and tracked uh, their survival rates compared to what I would expect if they were not given treatment. And survival was lower for patients who were treated in the chemotherapy unit compared to no treatment at all. So what we were doing was so dangerous prone to side effects and prone to errors, that we were basically like, torturing people, giving them months of horrible chemotherapy in exchange for like, uh, lower survival rates. Was this hospital run by the Red Cross? No. no I see. Yeah, so you were just there uh, in order to provide help? Yeah. Uh, did you try to shut down the whole operation at that point? <laughs> I did. I think first I showed up, I had like an in-country representative of the Red Cross and I showed up there and I was just kind of in tears and I had the findings of my study and my first thought was like I, I can't do this like we're torturing people here we're, we're harming people like we need to stop if what we're doing is worse than no treatment at all then it's better for these people to be home with their families but the Red Cross representative said like I should 
try to kind of work within the constraints of the hospital and figure out what I could do to improve it rather than just advocating for it to, the whole program to be shut down. So was there some alternative thing that they could do that would be uh, less prone to error and killing people? Yeah. So I decided to ask for help, basically. So I contacted a, a lot of oncologists, mostly based in the US, to ask for advice. And I just found them all on LinkedIn. And I got together a Facebook group with, yeah, like four or five oncologists who are based in the US who could provide support and could like check the treatment decisions that were being made. Uh, and then I set up an iPad that the hospital had so that the doctors there could Skype with the, these clinicians in America and get kind of advice and help for their treatment. And then together with those oncologists, we developed a checklist to go through and check calculations for the dosing of chemotherapy and to make sure that patients' vitals were checked before chemotherapy went ahead. Uh, we introduced a procedure where every calculation had to be checked by at least two people before it was signed off and that all had to be documented. Uh, and it was really difficult to get buy-in for that and to sort of uh, explain and motivate all of the staff at the hospital to engage in this double-checking procedure and to kind of follow that checklist because from their perspective, we were just giving them extra work. Why weren't they as troubled as you were about the fact that they were killing their patients? I have a couple of different theories on this, and I'm not sure like if any of them are correct. One thing is that the attitude towards a death and mortality is quite different in Bhutan. So a thing that kind of really like weirded me out was when a family member would pass away in the hospital, no one else in the family would, would cry or express grief because that was seen as sort of a sign of weakness or like you might be uh, preventing that, that spirit from sort of moving on to the next life. And so death was sometimes uh, seen as like a release or a celebration rather than something to be sad about. But the other thing was just that Bhutan was a really, the healthcare system was really hierarchical. And so most people saw their role as just doing their job and no one saw it as their ultimate responsibility to ensure patient safety and patient care. Bhutan is, has this international reputation for being like a super happy place. Uh, they've got this like happiness quotient, which is meant to be some national target. You could probably hear from the tone of my voice, I'm a bit skeptical of all of this. Uh, but yeah, did uh, your impression living there match with this international golden reputation? Somewhat so. I think like people's approach to, to suffering was rather stoic. So when bad things would happen or like, you know, tragic situations would occur, people wouldn't tend to appear very like visibly upset about those kinds of things. And people seemed pretty like happy and accepting of like whatever lot they were dealt in life and just tried to like care about their family or other things that brought them happiness and kind of fulfillment so that was definitely there but I think Bhutan has changed a lot over the last sort of eight to ten years uh, since it's undergone a lot of modernization they first brought in like tv and radio and uh, internet access and that's influencing the culture a lot uh, so now people are starting to see a lot more how uh, you know other people are living overseas and like uh, that that's changing the the goals that people aspire to so let's, let's come back to the hospital. Just mm -hmm. a final question. I mean, by the time you left, you, you tried to implement a bunch of reforms to uh, make the hospital net positive rather than net negative, mm -hmm. or at least the, the chemo part of it. Uh, do you think you succeeded by, by the time you left? Were, were they killing people on net? No, I think I failed. Like, I wasn't able to reliably get those processes to be implemented. And I think when I left, the chemo department was still net negative. But I think I did leave enough, like, seeds that sort of six months later that department did undergo a big restructure and a big review and sort of the the doctor who was in charge of chemotherapy there was replaced and a lot of other staff were sent for more training overseas uh, and there was a big improvement in patient safety. Well, why did you ultimately leave and then how long were you there for? I was in Bhutan for six months. In the end I didn't think that I was like having enough impact in the role there. I think there were a lot of challenges. Firstly I was very young and also I was female and I think those things meant that it was harder for me to bring about change uh, than it otherwise would have. I think had I been the same person but like a 60 year old man I would have been respected a lot more and it would have been easier for me to implement a lot of the changes that I wanted to uh, and that was something that, that I couldn't really change. And there were a couple of things that happened there with with patients that just kind of got to me and it, I found it very like emotionally difficult to be in Bhutan. So one case was where the head of the department prescribed a lethal dose of a, a chemotherapy to a, a six-year-old boy and 
the nurses and the pharmacists there were using this checklist and this checking procedure that I developed with these American oncologists and they noticed that the dose was way too high and that it would have been fatal if they gave it to the six-year-old boy and they made it anyway and so I intervened. The pharmacists had already made up the chemo and were ready to send it to the ward to give it to the boy and I I, I took that bag of, of chemo and, and destroyed it uh, because I, I knew if they gave it to the patient that he would die. And uh, I said I was going to find the doctor and kind of get that prescription changed and get the dose corrected to the right one. And while I was away looking for the doctor, the pharmacy department made a new bag of the same chemotherapy and sent it to the ward. And when I got back, the nurses were preparing to give the chemo to the boy. And I talked to the nurses and said, what are you doing? Don't you know that this dose is, is fatal and that it will kill him if you give this? Uh, and they kind of laughed nervously and they were like, yes, but doctor's orders, you know? Uh, and eventually I found the doctor. He took the prescription from my hands uh, sort of like, you know, turned away and I saw him kind of crumple it up and throw it away and he pulled out a new one with the correct dose and then handed it to me and he said, what are you talking about? There's no mistake. This is, this is the correct one. Why did you make the wrong dose? And that was something that was really hard for me to deal with. Like I think, had I not intervened, it seems very likely that they would have given that fatal dose of chemo to that boy and instead I had to say like, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake uh, and then go and like, make the right dose of chemo for that boy but things like that kind of really got to me after a while like I was really worried about what would have happened had I not been there and I didn't feel like I could really do very much to change some of the cultural factors that influence decision making in uh, cancer treatment it's an incredible story um let's let's push on there uh, we've only got so much time yep after uh Bhutan did you go back to Australia or is that when you moved to America yeah after Bhutan I decided to go to the Bay Area. I actually uh, I spoke to some people at CIFAR and I was saying that I'd like, done all these different things over my career. I didn't really think that I should go back and work as a pharmacist and I didn't think there were that many great opportunities for me in Australia. And I sort of wanted to spend some time really thinking about EA and about how I could have more of an impact in my career. And they suggested that I just like come to the Bay Area and volunteer at CIFAR and then that way I could meet lots of different people and talk to people who worked at all the various different organizations in EA and spend some time trying to figure out what the next step for me was. So after I had that conversation, I kind of got on a plane. I like left Bhutan six days later and showed up in the US. And what did you do at the Center for Applied Rationality at CIFAR? That was my first role where I started doing ops stuff. So I, I was kind of thrown in in the deep end. Like I think they didn't really have much of a plan for what I could do and how I could be useful. And so I ended up just kind of trying to observe and learn and figure out what I could do to improve CIFAR's operations. So again, I looked at how they were storing and transporting all of the different things that they used for workshops. I realized that they, they'd never prioritized accounting or bookkeeping, which meant that they had very little insight into how much it actually cost them to run workshops and how much income they were getting from all of the different, uh, you know, ways that they were admitting people. And so it was like hard for them to know whether they were like spending money effectively to achieve their goals. So I spent a lot of time looking into that. Okay. And then you came to work at uh, the Centre for Effective Altruism. What contributions though did you manage to make uh, at CEA? <laughs> so just for a bit of context, when I decided to take the job at CEA, I was really scared and I thought I was horribly unqualified and I thought that, you know, I had all of this other experience that wasn't going to be relevant to the job at all. Um, and somehow I thought CEA had like made a mistake in deciding to hire me <laughs> for this job. Very much true. <laughs> and, you know, I read the job description and thought, like, I don't know anything about UK accounting or tax law or, like, HR stuff. And I, I've never done all of these things that they're going to expect me to do or ask me to do. And so I was really thrown in in the deep end at CEA. Uh, and when I arrived there, I... I just sort of had to figure it out. And I thought that I would arrive and, like, you know, people would say, like, here's this long list of tasks that you should do and that you should just do them. But what I actually found was that the role was more about figuring out what the biggest bottlenecks were or what things needed to be done and then doing them. So I actually had a lot of autonomy and a lot of ability to kind of direct the work that I was doing and focus on figuring out what I could do and how I could use my time and my efforts and my skills most effectively to improve the operations of CEA. And that was something that I really thrived on. 
Uh, so it was a really great learning opportunity for me to just be thrown in there and have to figure out, you know, how how things work, how you run accounting for an organization, how you should go about hiring and onboarding new staff, and uh, what challenges CEA was facing, uh, how we could budget and make sure that we had uh, planned and prepared so that we all of our projects would succeed. Unfortunately, I don't have any, like, stories that are impressive from CEA as I do from, like, the hospital and other things. Like, I think a lot of the work that I did... We weren't murdering people <laughs> yeah. within the office, yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess the glass is half full. <laughs> and I think... A lot of the work that I did at CEA was was invisible to a lot of other people. Like I think a lot of what I did was focus on kind of identifying problems that would prevent us from scaling in the future and solving them before they became a bottleneck. So I would always think about what CEA would look like in three years' time and how I could set up systems now that would scale effectively and enable CEA to continue operating and continue moving at a fast pace so that operations would never be the bottleneck. Yeah, I think that, that is apparent. But for in, the, in the few years before you came, uh, we were like, we were struggling to, to grow and accommodate new staff, and then things definitely became a lot smoother uh, in, the, in the years after that. Um, are there any other lessons that you uh, can draw, draw from your time at, at CEA? Well, I think at CEA, I sometimes felt like I had like seven bosses, like 10 different bosses, and that there were um, lots of different projects going on with all different priorities. And I realized that I was in this unique position where I was a person who had a lot of information about all of the different aspects of CEA. Uh, and that meant that I was able to have a lot more influence than I first expected that I could have. Because whenever there was a question about you know, which project was the most cost effective or how we should allocate resources, I could be there and spout off these figures off the top of my head. Like, it will cost us this much money and this much time to onboard one new person or, you know, various other things. So through that, I was able to kind of like actually influence a lot of decisions that CEA made, even though I wasn't in a position of much authority when I first joined. Hmm. Yeah, do you feel people mostly listened to that information and made decisions based on, you know, the information you gave them or based on the right right information yeah i think absolutely and that was really nice like it was great to be in an environment where i felt like you know i could do a, a fermi estimate or something or like some some kind of really hacky calculation and that would be like heard and listened to and actioned on so after what was it a year and a half or two years you mm -hmm. got promoted to be ceo of yeah. the organization is that right yeah Tell me a little bit about, about how that happened and uh, I guess how you found it being CEO. Yeah, that was like a huge learning experience as well. I think as I felt like an operations role had actually prepared me and trained me really well for stepping into that role. One thing you have to do a lot of in operations is constantly shift your focus between kind of like all of the different levels of meta. You spend some time working on an object level task and then a lot of time thinking about the bottlenecks for the organization and the big picture priorities. And then as CEO, your job is often to pay attention to all of the things that are easily forgotten about or that other people are not paying attention to. So I spend a lot of time working on building an effective culture and environment at CEA so that we could accomplish our goals and be a productive and like functioning organization. And yeah, I think I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not spent so much time in operations roles before. Yeah, it's a very common move from COA to, to CEO. Yeah. Do you feel there were, there were any problems with, with that switch? Like, were there parts of the organization that you didn't understand as well? I think it was it was challenging. Like, I'd spent so much time as CEO basically trying to, like, please everyone else mm -hmm. and listen to everyone else and figure out what other people thought we should be doing with the organization. And suddenly then I was in a position where uh, I was expected to come up with the overall strategy for the organization and the overall priorities and kind of like lead more by fiat rather than by consensus. Mm. And it was difficult to balance that really well because I think it's really important as a leader that you make sure that you keep those channels of communication open and that you're constantly getting feedback from all of your staff about what the organization's doing, what we should prioritize and how things are going so that you can make good decisions. Uh, but you also need to be this source of a kind of stability and direction so that you can like keep things in check when the, the mission starts drifting a little bit or when uh, we're failing to prioritize some projects that are really important. Yeah, what are some of the most challenging things you've uh, had, to, had to solve uh, in, in the few years that you were at CEA? I think the thing that was really challenging for me was building a really great company culture at CEA. And I think this is one of those things that you read about all the time. Companies say you should have a set of values that you hire and fire against and that you kind of use to make decisions day in and day out. 
And I think it's easy to uh, like brush that aside and think that it's not a priority. But I think focusing on that was one of the most important and best things that I did in my time at CEA is I talked to all of the staff and came up with a list of values that we could agree on and then uh, built that into our hiring process, into the feedback that we did in our 360 reviews. And that was kind of an anchor for us like any time we were considering a new project or a new direction for the organization to go in we could come back to kind of those values and that culture and figure out how that fit in with the organization we were trying to build yeah 80,000 hours just wrote up our values and yes. I think I have yeah my gut says that it's just not important because like don't we already know this like isn't this just common sense but uh, yeah outside of you says that it's very important and I think uh, yeah we've already gotten benefits from it like when, when we have difficult cases we look at yeah what are, what are the principles that we lay down yeah and for me as a manager it just made my role so much more clear cut you know I noticed it was really important for me to kind of praise the behaviors that I wanted to see and things that I thought strengthened our culture and to kind of give staff feedback or like call people out when I thought they were doing things that destabilized the organization or were kind of counter to the values that we wanted to hold and promote yeah. as a company and I think that was re- like really great for improving staff morale and keeping everyone motivated and building a strong sense that we're all on the same team and we're all trying to accomplish the same things uh, and that was something we could fall back on whenever there were disagreements in the team about what we should focus on or how we should go about it yeah are there any values that you uh, put in that document that are, are unusual or that you wouldn't find in most uh, most such documents i think something that is probably like pretty common in the EA community but that you wouldn't find in another kind of organization is the one we call our best argument wins and the way that we operationalize that at CEA is that that anyone in the company can propose an idea for a project or like speak up about something that they disagree about and believe that that will be heard by management and like given airtime and debated based on uh, the merit of the idea itself uh, rather than sort of you know the seniority of the person or like anything else like that. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, in my experience, yeah, EA orgs like mostly do uh, live true to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose there, yeah, I mean, there can be like some some degree of like internal seniority that determines like which which ideas get taken more seriously, or at least like uh, which ones people are inclined to think uh, like come from someone with more experience. So, so maybe that maybe there there is like reason to give more weight to uh, people who've been around for longer and uh, perhaps have a better better intuition about what's going to work and what's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, by and large, it is like a very open uh, company culture. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, like, h- how did you find your kind of uh, interactions with other people in the organization or with uh, other organizations uh, working working in operations? Are there any like challenges there, or, or people people generally uh, like very enthusiastic to to get your help? Yeah, I generally found that while working on ops, I was actually given a lot of like recognition and respect and that wasn't something that I expected going into it. I sort of thought that ops was this role that was kind of like low status and like, you know, thought of as like something that was easy that anyone could do. But I actually found that like other people in the organization were constantly giving me lots of positive feedback because I was doing things every day that made their job easier and more satisfying. And so it was really rewarding for me. And I felt that like... I think like in any organization, when you're new, you do have to build up like trust and respect. And I kind of tried to just be like relentlessly competent and kind of like always execute on tasks to the best of my ability. And I think that helped me like really gain a lot of like trust and respect with other people in the organization, which then meant that my ideas were like heard and given airtime. And when I suggested something, people like took me seriously and kind of like really listened and were interested to hear like my point of view. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, are there any people working in operations in the EA community who would like to give a shout out to who you think are doing really impressive work? <laughs> um, well, I probably want to mention like lots of CEA people, but I feel a little bit bad about that. I mean, I think the the whole ops team at CEA has really come together and they don't kind of seek the spotlight very much. So people like Miranda and, and Caitlin, uh, like Caitlin spends a lot of time really trying to make sure that everyone in the organization is like, Uh, you know happy and satisfied with their work and she's really great at modeling people and uh like just kind of making time to like have a nice conversation with them at lunch so that they feel like they're they're part of the team and I think that's something that can easily be overlooked and isn't necessarily part of her job but something that makes a really big difference and Miranda is just sort of always like diving deep into like budgets and spreadsheets and uh like the legal code to try and find out what we should do and it's really great to see how excited she gets about things like that when i think that that's something that other people would might think is kind of like boring or like not very fun 
All right, let's turn now to uh, just general careers advice that you have for people who might want to contribute to effective altruist causes and organizations uh, through through operations roles. As I mentioned at the start, uh, we have this interview with Tanya Singh, where we go through a lot of the points that are in our, our article about this. And I'm actually not sure which, which of these will come out first and which will come out second. But uh, Tanya mostly uh, agreed, I think, with the, with the core message uh, in, in that article um, and uh, you know, hit on most of the key points uh, that, that we made there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm particularly interested to hear from you whether, you, yeah, to what extent you disagree with what 80,000 Hours has written uh, or uh, to what extent you disagree with you know, uh, just people's views about these careers uh, in, in general, uh, what kind of distinctive perspective you, you have. I think one thing I sort of object to is this framing of operations work as predominantly providing value through like, you know, freeing up time for researchers or other people at the organization to be able to do more. And that's sort of not how I see it at all. I think that operations is itself a distinct skill set and the work that a really good ops person would do just can't be substituted for with like, you know, some other, like a researcher or someone else doing it. And so you could think of operations work as kind of like this like fixed multiplier where you need one operations person for every like three researchers you have. And so in order to scale the organization, uh, you need some number of ops people. But I think that a good ops person doesn't just allow you to scale linearly, but also can help kind of figure out bottlenecks and solve problems such that the organization is able to do qualitatively different work rather than just increase the total quantity of work that's done by researchers. Uh, For example, I feel like so many times people have come to me and said, oh, like, I don't know, why don't why don't we do this thing or why don't we uh, solve this problem? Uh, And uh, I've been able because I have so much context on the organization and how it runs and all of the things that go into any of the projects, I can suggest ways of solving that problem that other people wouldn't have come up with that actually make it possible to do a project that wouldn't have been possible uh, if we'd only thought of it the other way. Yeah. So, okay. So, so do you agree that there are like flows of value which are saving time and like allowing the organization to get bigger? But you think that that's missing like a, a big part of the value that's provided, which yeah, is absolutely. just that you can do things that otherwise would be impossible. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you have any have any examples of the kinds of things that um, you can only do when you have outstanding op stuff? I mean, I think something like running EA Global is a really great example here. Like, EA Global required a lot of work and hundreds of hours from a lot of really talented operations people, and that's a skill set that is kind of unique there. And something like that couldn't have been pulled off effectively without really talented ops people. There are so many little things that go into making a conference run smoothly, things that you just, like, wouldn't even think of. Uh, And, like, a good ops person can predict all of the things that might possibly go wrong and realise how many power boards you need to have, how many like kind of you know backup systems you need what you're going to do if someone's running late and like how to deal with crowds and various other things that make the conference run really smoothly and effectively and make it a really great productive experience for everyone who's there yeah one one thing that i think makes clear that this multiplier argument isn't capturing everything it's just that there's some organizations where ops is the thing that they're doing it's the whole thing they're not enabling anything else i think like delivery of drugs uh, was an example that i gave in the conversation with tanya that kind of the against malaria foundation is just basically ops uh, <laughs> uh, in its like conception and then also just like manufacturing is to such a such a large extent like ops it's like both like designing the system and then like implementing it well mm-hmm. uh there's nothing else being enabled it is it is the whole thing is ops <laughs> yeah do you think that's about right uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And right. I think a lot of people like you know couldn't even conceive of an organization like AMF without this kind of optimizing mindset or operations focused mindset. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And in terms of like better staff allowing you to do qualitatively different things, I mean like car manufacturing, I've like learned a bit about that. It's just like so extraordinarily complicated and like even small errors can bring down the the entire process. Mm-hmm. And yeah, basically unless you have really good people uh, at all these levels, um, the, 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 it's like you, you'll you never make a car. <laughs> yeah. And uh, basically the only way that you can have modern um, modern car manufacturing processes is to have amazing stuff uh, at every point. I, I, you, I mean, you can, you can make cars just in a very inefficient way that like we haven't done uh, for like 50 or 100 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because we have uh, better processes now. Yeah. I think a lot of op stuff is about reducing the risk of failure and also reducing catastrophic errors. Mm. And so good op stuff can often make a project possible that would have otherwise been uh, cost prohibitive or would have been too risky to embark upon because of all of the negative consequences of failure. But if you can really go through and figure out how the project might degrade or what uh, bottlenecks you're going to face, then it makes embarking on some of those projects seem possible when they, they otherwise wouldn't be. Yeah. Do you have any examples of that? Probably just little things like the process we used for EA grants or EA global applications. We were able to build a pretty automated system for 
uh, tracking all of the applications, kind of scoring them, reviewing them, and following up with people to make sure that tickets were bought or that uh, grant applications were reviewed. And that meant that we were able to review uh, like 700 applications for EA grants and come up with uh, grants that we were really excited about making. Uh, whereas had we not built that mostly automated process, it would have been prohibitive to look at 700 grant applications. And maybe we could have only taken in a handful or 30 applications from uh, a pool of people that we sort of already knew and thought might have really good ideas. And that means we were able to cast a much wider net and uh, come across lots of projects that we otherwise wouldn't have seen. Yeah. Are you able to share what that what that process was? Or is that a... <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit. I mean, a lot of systems at CEA are based around Zapier. So we use a lot of Google spreadsheets that are connected and a lot of, you know, MailChimp automations and things like that to send out emails. So we have to kind of map out every step in the process in advance and uh, all of the interactions that we'll have with, with applicants, either to EA Global or to EA Grants, uh, when we're going to send out those emails and make sure that all of the right things happen at the right time and that no balls get dropped along the way. Okay, so yeah, are there any things that we said in, in, in the article or like perhaps perhaps the framing of them where, where you think uh, we've, we've gone down the wrong direction? I think one thing that was kind of missing for me is how much job satisfaction you can get in an ops role. And I think like ops is sort of sold as this thing that can be super motivating because you can free up time for all of these other people and then it enable more like direct work that you care about to get done. But I think that the job itself is actually really exciting and interesting and it gives you a great opportunity to learn and to skill up. So ops has a lot of great feedback loops and a lot of variety as well. So you're constantly learning new skills, doing different types of tasks and getting to improve how well you do all of those things. And then you get feedback from reality. You know when your plan worked and you know how like how effectively you were able to solve that problem and then you can do it better next time. And you also get a lot of autonomy. Like a lot of the work is really self-directed. Uh, so this means that you know, you're working, a lot of the time you're working on concrete tasks, so you get a sense of progress, you have a lot of autonomy and freedom to choose what you want to do, and the day-to-day -day work contains so many different things that you kind of never get bored. So I think the job itself is really satisfying, not just because you know how much impact you're having, uh, but also because the work itself is really like fun and challenging. Yeah, I guess uh, one way that it could be less fun is if you get kind of swamped with administrative tasks or things like that, or just get like kind of paper cut uh, into uh, a potentially boring role that doesn't have enough strategy or enough like in innovativeness in it. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? And, uh, and if so, like, how do you think you can avoid that? Yeah, I don't agree with that. I oh. think that like a really important mindset for someone working in operations to have is this idea of like, how can I automate this task away? So if you do find yourself swamped with uh, administrative work, like responding to emails, you should go one level meta and think, how can I reduce the load of this kind of work? And how can I make the system easier uh, and take less time and less energy? Or how can I outsource this so that that's not part of my job anymore? Which gives you a lot of freedom. Basically, like anything that you don't like doing or that you find like pretty annoying, then you can spend time figuring out how to make it smoother and easier and like less a part of your job. Uh, what about just getting overwhelmed with the volume of like tasks that, that are directed uh, to, to, towards you? I've seen some operations people find that hard. And I, I think part of that is because uh, that we don't have enough operations people, which is partly why we're <laughs> having, having uh, shows about it. Yeah. Do, do you think is, is that potentially like a source of career dissatisfaction? I think that is both a blessing and a curse. Like sometimes it can feel like you're swamped all of the time and like, I don't know, you never make a dent in the amount of work that you have coming in. But the flip side of that is that there's always something that is urgent and a high priority that you can do uh, that you know will like make a difference to your organization. Mm. And so if there's something you're kind of stuck on or not very excited about, then you have some other project that you can be working on that's also a super high priority. And so you can kind of pick and choose a little bit like which things you'll work on and how you'll focus on them. And it sort of means that the job never gets boring uh, and it never feels like mundane or routine. Like, yeah. There's always a new challenge. Cool. Let's come back to yeah potential disagreements that you that you have mm -hmm. um, with the article. Yeah, is there anything else where you'd have a different emphasis or disagreement? Yeah, I think you guys touch on this in the article, but I think it's a like common objection that a lot of people in the community have, where people say that, well, why don't you just hire like non EAs to fill a lot of these roles? Mm. And I think my take, and definitely something that I did at CEA, was to hire people who are like really committed and embedded in the community for these roles. And I think that that's really important because in operations, you spend so much of your time prioritizing and really trying to figure out what the bottlenecks for the organization are and how you can enable that growth. And to do that, you need a 
huge amount of context on the organization, the community that you're a part of, uh, all the different organizations working in the space, uh, what you need to have your finger on the pulse of the community, of what things are important to them and how that matters. And I think it's really hard to make the right calls time and time again without all of that context. And that's something that's definitely been challenging for us. Like, um, I mean, this is kind of a straw example, but like, I think sometimes we've had, when we've tried to outsource some of these things, people from a more like traditional non-EA background will be overly focused on kind of professionalism or making sure that you fully comply with all of the legal restrictions. Whereas the approach that we tend to take is more to try and look at like what are the costs of non-compliance and what bad things actually happen if we don't like tick every box on some government checklist and then figure out how much time and effort we should spend on these things versus all of the other priorities in the organization. And I think that's something that's really hard to do without this kind of like context and EA culture. Yeah, I remember uh, a few years ago, CA tried outsourcing a bunch, I think, of the, the financial work to a uh, prominent professional services company that you've probably heard of. How did, how did that go? Oh, that was horrendous. It was astounding to us, like, <laughs> how, like, useless it was and how much better it was when we, like, did those things in-house, when we had so much more context on, like, the goals that we had for our financial statements and what figures were important to us. And I think the take that we had was just so different from other small businesses that they were used to working with mm. that they weren't able to, like, be really helpful to us. Yeah. Uh, at one point, that, that ball was in my court and I... Uh, <laughs> And I was like probably mildly in favor of also trying to outsource this stuff, but uh, I never got around to doing it. So I kind of succeeded through, uh, su- succeeded by failing <laughs> on that one. Um, I guess, uh, did uh, we extricate ourselves from that relationship in the end and then bring it back in internally? Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah. And like now we have uh, outsourced a lot of the bookkeeping function, but mm-hmm. that really required us to learn a lot more about what was required and to sort of make a distinction between which things we were required to do for reporting purposes and which things we wanted to be able to do so that we could have accurate financial information in order to make management decisions about the organization and how we could sort of satisfy all the reporting requirements while also getting all the figures that we needed to make those decisions. And so we actually had to learn a lot about accounting and about all of these uh, reporting processes so that we could design a system in conjunction with like qualified accountants that's like met both of those needs. Okay, this is fantastic. So uh, just uh, let's just keep going down the list. Is there anything else uh, where you wanted to uh, co- correct the record? <laughs> yeah. One thing that I think is really great about working in ops is that it's a cause neutral skill set in some sense. Like I think uh, with the experience and skills that I have now, I could go work in AI, I could work in bio-risk, or I could work for um, an organization in global health. And there are lo- so many different things I could do. So I think that ops gives you really a good flexibility and it's really like a great avenue to go down if you're someone who's like pretty uncertain about like how your views might change in the future or think that as you learn more or as EA grows and changes that uh, you might you know not want to specialize too soon and develop this like really highly specialized skill set that only makes sense in some worlds. I think another thing is that like I think ops actually gives you really awesome career capital and particularly working in ops in an EA organization is not what it used to be. Like, I think ops train skills that are really transferable to any kind of organization, and it gives you an opportunity to... Like, you have a lot of opportunities for advancement and taking on a lot more responsibility than you'd ever get in a, a junior role in the traditional corporate sector. So I feel like... I'm really well placed, like if I wanted to go, say, back to working consulting or something else, that the skills that I've gained through working at ops roles and EA orgs would be looked upon really favorably uh, and more so than if I'd taken a junior role in in a corporate job in the first place. Because you're effectively, you've got like a a view of the entire organization and also the, the freedom to just reorganize it according to what seems more efficient. Yeah. And I think another thing that people like often don't prioritize is kind of um, cool stories. Yeah. Like I think when you go into a, a job interview, if you can tell a story about how you went into an organization and changed things and really improved that organization, that's going to get you so much further than saying you just went in and kind of like did the job that you were expected to do really well. And I know that now, uh, you know, like any startup would be really excited about hiring ops people who've worked uh, at EA organizations because they've had that breadth and depth of experience in, in so many different areas and they've constantly had to kind of just solve problems on the fly and pick up new skills. I think another thing that's important is like if you think that you might ever want to 
found your own project or organization in the future, then working in ops is probably one of the fastest ways to gain that kind of skill set. Because uh, you learn how to run an organization from the ground up and getting that like deep knowledge of all the things that go into running an organization and decision making and like prioritizing what you work on and how is really, really important if you ever want to set up your own project. So I'd recommend working in ops for a bit for anyone who thinks that they might want to run their own company or run their own project in the future. Yeah. Yeah, the, the skills do seem uh, exceedingly transferable. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of an, an analogy to earning to give, that if you're making money, then you can like direct it wherever you think it's going to be best used. And I think similarly, if you have good ops skills, then you have a good shot at getting into basically any project, almost any project, uh, might, yeah. might be interested in hiring you. Yeah. Another thing that I think is a common misconception about working in ops is that you need to be like super organized and detail-oriented. Mm. Uh, and I know I'm certainly not like that. And... I think like the sort of this um, this perception that you need to have a really good GTD system and track all of the different tasks and like write everything down and never forget anything. But I think ops actually requires a, a much deeper problem solving skill set. And what you actually need is a lot of like creativity and initiative and like working memory and to succeed at ops like just being kind of like generally smart and well motivated will probably get you further uh than only just being super organized so i think i talk to a lot of people who are interested in working in ops and they'll say to me like oh but like i i'm not very organized or i'm a bit forgetful and they think that that rules them out uh and so i kind of want people to know that that's not the only thing that matters and you can uh be really effective by just taking initiative and like coming up with creative solutions to problems yeah yeah, my role in EA hasn't uh, mostly been ops most of the time, but I've had like yeah, pr- pretty major exposure to it. And I feel one of the areas where I improved the most was just like an intuitive judgment about what things are going to be a disaster and what things are not. Uh, you, you're yeah. nodding your head. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 talk, talk, talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just laughing because I feel like we've had a conversation like that so many times within CEA where, I don't know, I think it's common to think that some outcome would be kind of inconceivably bad or just like not an option but we've needed to kind of assess that and figure out like what bad things will actually happen if we fail like let's say if we failed our next audit or something like that and then once you sit down and you look at like how bad that outcome is it like brings things into perspective and then you're able to make those decisions much more quickly in the future when you like constantly look at what bad things will happen if you don't do it Uh, and simultaneously like a lot of things that don't seem like a big deal do do end up actually like taking up a lot of staff time and attention a thing that that's been huge for cea uh is things that affect staff morale so um and it's it's easy to to think that that uh is like not a priority but uh you know if there's say a disagreement between two people that could end up taking up uh hundreds of hours of of lost productive work time because people are feeling a bit demotivated or like don't feel comfortable in the work environment so that is sort of a bigger disaster than some of the things that like seem more obvious yeah uh those are good examples Uh, the, the kind of thing that i was thinking of is um people often come up with ideas or like ways of arranging things uh, like, Oh, we're going to like order the lunches in this particular way. Something as simple as that. And these days I just have a much better intuition for like when this is actually going to involve like a hell of a lot more faff than what it initially seems that this is going to create coordination problems and like conflict and actually be very hard to organize. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, yeah, when I, when I started out working, I just didn't appreciate how often like things that seem very simple on the surface can actually lead to like huge amounts of waste of time. Um, if, especially if they're not implemented uh, really, really well. Do, do, do you have the same sentiment? Yeah, for sure. I think a thing that springs to mind for me is um, the expense reporting procedure. And I know this is something that lots of organizations have looked into. And you can very easily end up in a situation where lots of your staff are just not submitting expense reports and not getting reimbursed for things because, like, they don't know how or the process is kind of annoying. And that means that the organization is both not reflecting its true costs Mm. when they look at that. Uh, And also that their staff are kind of dissatisfied and unhappy because they're, like, spending their own money uh, for things constantly. Or maybe they're, like don't buy things that would make them much more productive in the workplace because they don't want to deal with the hassle of like submitting all the receipts. So something as simple as making that process really smooth and easy can mm. make a huge difference. Yeah. Having this intuition about how people actually interact with systems is oh and just, God, just yes. so that you're like, <laughs> when, when, when you're designing something, uh, you can just see how it's going to fail ahead of time. It's so helpful that like you get this like red, red flashing lights going off in your brain that this is going to be a disaster. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> many people like, 
when they naively try to design a system, uh, assume that the users will interact with it perfectly and exactly intended. And I think it's a really important step to think of, like, to actually sit with people and watch what they do and yeah. think about, like, what people will actually do or what they'll try to do when they interact with this system and, like, how the users will actually use it in the real yeah. world rather than your, like, you know, what you think they should do. And you need yeah. to kind of, like, I don't know, like, work with human nature a bit more and, like, think through, like, what happens if someone forgets to do this step like, how are you going to make sure that it does get done? Mm. And, like, how that uh, system degrades over time. When it gets passed on to someone else who doesn't understand it, for example. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we were talking about how these skills are incredibly transferable. And that's been, been my experience that this is, like, uh, useful in kind of all jobs that I have. And also just in my personal life as well. Just uh, mm -hmm. seeing where things are going to, uh, yeah, are not going to work as, as I might have naively thought when I was 20. Yeah. A thing that was really transferable for me is getting an intuitive sense of how much time it's worth spending on any particular research path. Mm. So I noticed that before I would often keep like, you know, looking up the same topic and reading more and more about it. And before I knew I had spent six or eight hours on something and I then in retrospect would realize I hit diminishing returns after the first hour. And I think ops caused me to really hone that process. So I had this sense of when I was starting to gain less information. So I think that ops has also made me much better at, at research tasks and, and, and solving problems. And even something as simple as like doing literature reviews, I think that I'm, I'm like much better at that because I've had this experience. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Do you, are, there, are there any more things that you wanted to, to clarify? Uh, yeah, another thing that I wanted to point out is um, so many people who are good at ops don't realize that they have that skill set. And mm. I think the reason for that is that when you're good at something, it feels easy. Mm. And so I hear so many people say like, well, all I did is I just kind of did the obvious thing. Mm. And the thing that is easy to forget is like, just because it's obvious to you yeah, yeah. doesn't mean that it's obvious to other people. Yeah, so, if we'd given this to someone else, they would have burnt the, the entire <laughs> office down. <laughs> yeah, or they would have forgotten some really simple, yeah. some really simple step. And I remember... One time I was trialing someone, uh, two different people for an operations task, and they had to do something really exceedingly simple, which was like pick up a package from a depot. And one person, it took them three days because the first time they went and the office was closed. And the second time they went, they didn't have the ID that they needed. <laughs> and so they only got the package on the third time. And the first person, as soon as I said, like, can you go pick up this package? They called and found out what time they were open mm -hmm. and what they needed to bring. Uh, and they made sure that that package was there. And so they went and they'd accomplished the whole task in an hour with the mm -hmm. phone call. And it's like really simple things like that that like really show you um, what kind of mindset you need to yeah. figure out like what are all the ways that this thing could go wrong in a like stupidly simple task. Yeah. Um, I actually think that there is a bit of a trade-off between um, that kind of operational competency, I think, sometimes, and being a good academic. I think these mm. things are, like, negatively, well, maybe not in every field, but uh, I really believe that there's this, like, archetype of the, um, like, muddle-headed philosopher, and basically all of their thinking is going into, like, these philosophical issues, and so they just, like, can't even make their own breakfast properly. Or they're, just, like, <laughs> they're just messing up simple tasks. I don't know, that, that, that actually has been my experience. And, that, like, the, the more you're actually, like, uh, doing the op stuff, right, uh, it can be, uh, yeah, you, you don't have your head in the clouds, but then I guess maybe you miss the, miss the things up there. Yeah, I think this is something that's really challenging for an ops person, actually, is how to figure out how people who are very different from <laughs> them interact will interact with, these with the morons. system, <laughs> yeah. or how, the, how people like that will yeah. interact with systems they right. build. And they'll think that something is just like really obvious or like very easy, um, but then they'll try and delegate it to someone else mm -hmm. who, who won't think that those steps are obvious. So you really need to like check and figure out what things you need to make explicit and what things you need to write down when you're like delegating that task to someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a totally different mindset. Yeah, I mean, uh, true in management in general, I think uh, it's, I, I always underestimate how many instructions I have to give or how clear I have to make anything because obviously, I mean, it's the uh, what, illusion of transparency. Yeah. Um, oh, is that the right term? Well, the curse of knowledge maybe, just yeah. that like it's, Things are very obvious to, to the person who's uh, giving them, but very hard to, to yeah. understand. One thing I will push back on a little with mm. that, though, is I think like something that ops people are really good at is figuring out how to solve problems. Mm. And so sometimes, like I've had so, so many conversations where someone will try to like delegate a task, or they'll say to an ops person, like you know, I need this piece of information, and they won't say what they need it for or why it's important or like when they need it. But instead, if they just say what goal they're trying to achieve, the ops person could maybe suggest like. 10 different things that would take half the amount of time or be like really easy and would do a better job of solving the problem than like the thing that they first suggested. Mm. So I, I think like delegating at the level of the goal rather yeah. than the task is really important. Yeah, makes sense. Just one last thing is that I think ops requires really good 
social and political skills mm. and like even if you're not in a management role because your job is to interact with everyone both inside the company and also lots of external stakeholders mm. and to keep your vendors happy and all the contractors that you work with so you really need to be good not just at modeling systems but at modeling people mm. and you know figuring out who the decision makers are and what those blocks are mm. and so working in ops is a really good way to kind of train this like organizational management skill and your kind of like political skill and figure mm. out how people interact together to form effective teams and how you can kind of bring that about. What kind of people do you think ops isn't for? I think if the idea of working in a really fast-paced environment where you you constantly have more tasks than you have time for and so many different demands on your time and you're juggling lots of different priorities sounds like really stressful and overwhelming, then maybe ops isn't the best fit. Similarly, if you're someone who tends to get really sucked into rabbit holes and spending like a lot of time like diving really deep into one particular topic and like really enjoys getting into deep work, then ops might not be the best fit because ops requires a lot of context switching and task switching and being able to like cut off that chain of thought and pull yourself out of that rabbit hole and stop once you've like, you know, gained most of the information that you need. And also, if like you're someone who just like doesn't think it sounds like fun or exciting to kind of build systems and optimize them, like if you want to kind of try once and be done, then like ops isn't for you because ops is about like building a system and iterating a hundred times until you've built like the best possible system. And sometimes that means throwing all of your work away and starting from scratch with something new. And if that sounds kind of demoralizing or demotivating, then I don't think it'd be a good fit. Okay, so we're almost done. But I'm imagining if I was uh, if I was listening to this, um, I might have heard all these stories of uh, your your uh, career between a, you know sixteen and twenty three, and be thinking, uh, like, can I can I live up to this? Because it feels like you've just been a whirlwind of like efficiency improvements, or at least attempted efficiency improvements everywhere that you've gone. Um, and it's, and you don't you don't even you don't even completely sure where you developed the skill uh, before you started doing this. Do you feel like someone who perhaps doesn't have the confidence or or the, or the record of doing this kind of work in in the past? Uh, should should they like seriously consider applying for these roles, um, and and how can people tell whether they're, whether they're a good fit? I think that a lot of people don't even try to do a lot of these things because they think that they need permission or that it's not their job. So I'd recommend first just like try some things like whatever job you're in, whatever project you're working on now, try to think about how you could improve it or what things you could change to make your workflow more efficient or to make the project more likely to succeed and just give it a go. And I think my experience was really about building a success spiral and starting with really small things that just made my life easier or my job easier for myself and then figuring out how I could like expand that and spread that to other people as well and I think that really like set me down the path of developing this deep skill set and it was something that came with a lot of practice and a lot of honing it didn't just kind of like pop out of nowhere I think some people do just kind of natively have this mindset you know I like talk to some people who say like oh I tried walking home from work three different ways and timed them all and found that this one was the most efficient and took like two minutes less than this other time or you know I'll like meet some people who take pleasure in making sure that they're always exactly on time to meetings and never too early or too late uh, and they'll know how long every step in their commute takes so that they can like optimize that and when I'll come across someone who just like optimizes really silly things in their life I'll think like this person will be great at ops. I think another thing to note is people who are uh, if you're just kind of like paying attention to systems whether they're imposed on you or whether you build them yourself and noticing like if you're the kind of person who who gets kind of irked by things that don't quite like work smoothly or like you know inefficiencies in, in other systems that you interact with and you feel a desire to kind of like change it or you can see how you could do that better then you're probably a person who'd be great at ops my guest today has been tara mccauley thanks for coming on the Eighty Thousand hours podcast tara thank you <laughs> it was fun if you enjoyed that episode Look out for my conversation with Tanya Singh, which goes into more detail about how you can make a difference by building effective organizations. Should come out in the next week or two. Remember that if you'd like to make a difference this way, the Center for Effective Altruism is currently looking to hire an event specialist, UK operations specialist, US operations specialist, and project manager for the office of the CEO. You can apply at centerforeffectivealtruism.org slash careers up until the 6th of July. For other positions, take a look at our article, Why Operations Management is One of the Biggest Bottlenecks in Effective Altruism, which I'll link to in the show notes. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.